History. Today's video is going to be a continuation on the Fast History series. Before we begin, I'd like to dedicate this video to the memory of Lynn Fox, who was a dear friend of mine and a fellow historian. Uh, Mr. Fox loved to attend reenactments where he always dressed up as uh, John Severe. He was also one of the few genuine people that you are privileged to meet in life, and so today's video, in his honor, is going to be about John Severe. If you like the content of this channel, please consider subscribing. You can always change your mind later. So let me tell you a little bit about old John Severe. So not too much is known about his early life, but John was born near Newmarket, Virginia on September 23, 1745. He was the first of seven kids born to Ballantyne Sr. and Joanna Goad Severe. Severe family had moved from France where they were known as the Xaviers, or however you pronounce that in French, to England, and by 1740, they made their way across the pond to the colonies. Now, John Severe had re received little formal education, although he did briefly study in Fredericksburg at Staunton Academy. It is said that as a youngster, he demonstrated uh, high qualities of maturity, perseverance, affability, and good judgment, which later in adult life made him a great leader among frontier people. By the time he turned 16, he married Sarah Hawkins and settled in a valley close to the place of his birth. And there he made a living as a land speculator, fur trader, and by 1773, he received a commission by the Virginia military. But in that year, he moved with his family to the Watauga region of North Carolina. So he didn't really get to pursue that. Now then, that was known as the Southwest Territory. But John would become the commissioner of this thing called the Watauga Association, which in short was a government of frontiersmen who petitioned North Carolina officials for recognition of Watauga. By this time, his legacy began to gain speed, and he would be labeled as a scourge of the Cherokee. In 1780, when the Revolutionary War creeped into the frontier lands, Major Patrick Ferguson, the British officer assigned to protect the left flank of Lord Cornwallis' troops had been annoyed by the frontiersmen, told them to lay down their arms and give allegiance to the crown, or they would hang their western leaders and lay the country to waste with uh, fire and sword. Severe, not one to back down from a challenge, called Ferguson's bluff and got together a group of frontiersmen armed with rifles went to meet him. They encountered Ferguson's army of more than 1,000 men at Kings Mountain, just over the border in South Carolina. Ferguson made the big mistake of claiming that even the Almighty couldn't drive him off that mountain, and those were words he would come to eat. Severe and the over-mountain men would mop the floor with him, and they killed and wounded more than one-third of the troops and made prisoners of the others. This would be considered a major turning point in the War for Independence. Just to backtrack a little, talks of Western statehood began way before the war ever ended. Thomas Jefferson had developed plans for about a dozen new states, and this prompted considerable interest from other frontiersmen. Now, it was the spirit of independence and the desire for recognition that brought this state of Franklin into being, with Severe as the governor. It would be considered a direct act of treason by North Carolina, who tried to water down the movement for statehood in several ways, but the movement for statehood only lasted a few years anyway, and it ended with Severe's arrest and almost being charged with treason. The actions of Severe and the Franklin Committee would continue to reverberate throughout history, even today as this would be, go on to be considered the first attempt at an independent government formed by American-born citizens. And for more on the state of Franklin, please see my video titled, History of the Lost State of Franklin. So in the same year that Franklin collapsed, Severe would be arrested and charged with treason, but never actually tried. He was later appointed to the North Carolina Senate and participated in the passage of a resolution pardoning him for his association with the rebellious Franklinites. He later represented Greene County in the convention in which North Carolina voted to ratify the new federal constitution. By 1790, he was elected to Congress, but would only serve one term, and would return home to assist in the affairs of the Southwest Territory. Now, he was probably the choice of the majority for the backwoodsman for governor of this new territory, but that appointment was given to his friend William Blunt, who immediately appointed Severe as one of two brigadier generals and Severe would also play a prominent role in the civil as well as military affairs of this territory. The territorial government continued to function until 1796 when Tennessee was admitted as the 16th state in the Union. 
in the selection of officials, voters elected Severe as governor, and he would be re-elected in 1797 and again in 1799, although he would be defeated by Archibald Drone in 1801, and he would return to land speculation and military activity and so on. But the political calling drew him back to defeat Drone with no opposition in 1803. He would be re-elected in 1805 and in 1807, making him a six-term governor. During his time as governor, Sevier was faced with the problems of an ever-growing frontier state, with towns like Knoxville, Jonesboro, Rogersville, and Nashville becoming commercial trade centers, drawing in huge numbers of people. It's thought that the state population grew from about 85,000 to more than 250,000 while he was governor, but this wasn't the only issue, as the Cherokee had not yet been forced out of Tennessee, or even the South at this point, and the threat of rage was still very high, and rightfully so. So Sevier faced these threats with the Teleco and Dearborn treaties, as well as other actions, which actually were successful and helped to uh, reduce the number of attacks taking place. After his final term as his governor in 1809, the old frontiersman was elected for one term to state senate. He tried again for senator, but would be defeated by Judge Joseph Anderson. He was later elected to the 12th, 13th, and 14th sessions of Congress. Early in 1815, while still in Congress, he was appointed to a commission to survey boundary provisions after a treaty was executed with the Creek Indians in the territory that became the state of Alabama. He died while fulfilling that obligation and was buried with full honors by federal troops on the east bank of the Tallapalooza River, near Fort Decatur, and in 1887 his body was exhumed and reinterred on the court square in Knoxville, Tennessee.